Welcome to today's episode of Confessions of a Cleaning Business Owner. And today we've got a special guest, Keith Hennebel. Um, I'm Louise, your host as always. But Keith is going to be talking to us today about mental health, in particular men's mental health. And he's a bit of an expert to be coming on here talking about this because he owns MBT Cleaning down in Kent. Um, But he also owns a podcast, MBT Unplugged. And his last couple of podcasts have been talking about this. And the feedback from men is that more people need to be talking about this. And I've known Keith for quite a while. He's fantastic. He's been a brilliant member of the DCBN and... um, I've been quite upset, obviously, to hear what's gone over over the last three months. It's something that Keith has struggled with. So, Keith, tell us what's been going on and why it is you've decided to so openly talk about what's going on for me. Well, thanks for the uh, introduction. Amazing, as always. Um, Yeah, so really, the reason I wanted to talk about it is because it's affected me directly. I've had depression for years, normally well managed. There's the odd occasion I'll have a blip where I really struggle and I need external help but from a male perspective I found that it's harder to deal with um, because it's not talked about as much so to get that help and also is there's a big part of it where you feel alone and that is something I wanted to get out there to a lot of people and are you happy so yeah, to my, tell my, well, what has happened to you over the last few months? Because I know that really between December and sort of March, it's been quite tough for you, hasn't it? Yeah, so I, I had a major blip. Uh, ultimately had a breakdown. Um, now, most of those that know me, certainly on social media within the DCBN, wouldn't have noticed um, because, again, as men are, I'm very good at hiding it. Um, so you sort of pop up once in a while, put your head above the parapet and you deal with it. But I really struggled uh, to the point that, um, yeah, I I had a, a complete and utter meltdown and it I was completely broken, really. Um, so then I had to deal with it. So, and it was, you know, it, the, the ironic thing is there was nothing specific this time round that caused it. You know, I'm in a good place. I have a great, successful business. I have a fantastic relationship. We can afford things, you know, we don't have financial issues. So this is the usual stuff within business or your personal. But ultimately, someone from looking from outside would be like, why are you feeling like this? And, and no, and that's well, hard, I was, you know. I, I was going to say to you, so I'm so sorry for everything you've been through, Keith. I remember I had texted you. I was like, where have you gone, Keith? Like, what's happened? And obviously all of this <laughs> came out. But Keith, it's not just you, is it? We know that men, particularly men in their in their thirties and forties, have a much higher suicide rate than women. You know, you've worked on the ambulance. You've obviously had to. Uh, you've been exposed to a lot of people with probably very chronic mental health episodes at the time. What is going on? Why is it that men are so much more affected by this than women? I think a lot of it comes down to isolation, um, if I'm really honest. Um, again, you, we talked about this last week on our podcast, and it comes down to a generational side of things. As you're growing up from, you know, as right or wrong as this may be, men are supposed to be the breadwinners, they're the strong ones, they're there for the family. And no matter what goes on in life, they will sacrifice themselves for everyone else, regardless of what's going on with them. And that's the point where mental health sneaks in and it digs a little bit at a time. And then you feel alone. You feel you can't turn to people because you're supposed to be strong. You're supposed to. Men don't cry, for example. You know, Um, that is changing as generations grow and grow. But at the moment, still, there's a huge part of it where you've got to deal with it yourself. That is it, you know. And you've heard the saying, man up. That's probably the biggest one that will hurt the most. So I, I, I spoke to my husband when coming up with the questions for these and um, he did not want to come and talk about mental health. He does not talk about it. <laughs> um, and I guess, you know, it's really common not talking about the emotions. But what is it that stops men from discussing their problems? Because 
you know, Diane and I will come on and really quite talk openly to the world sometimes on our podcast about what's going on. And we are much more open in pro- anyone that wants to listen to my problems. I want to talk about them. You know, my favorite question is, Louise, tell me what your thoughts are on this. I'm like, yes, let's really tell you. Why is that so different for men? Again, it comes down to communication and, and the strength thing, doesn't it? You know, um, you think of a conversation between two women. You, as you've just said, you will openly talk about everything. There is literally no taboos as such. With men, if I was to say to you, you and your partner go and talk about, um, let's say, someone's had a baby within your friend's group. He goes and visits his friend in hospital, sees his wife and baby, and, and then comes back and you say to him, how heavy was the baby? What was the baby's name? What time was it born? All this stuff. He, he will turn around to you and go, I don't know, because men don't talk about that. We don't communicate like that. And that's something as you're growing up, you're taught almost. It, it, it's a way of internalize it, deal with it, move on, and then block it off. That's all you need to do. That, and that's the whole man up thing. Whereas women don't do that. You will talk about everything and anything. Um, and it's yep. changing that perspective. You have to change that perspective, otherwise you'll break. And how did this impact you then? So during your latest episode, was it that you weren't prepared to talk about things or, or what specifically happened and how did it get better? Yeah, so again, we, you know, within our family group, like Beck does stuff with depression as well and I'm, you know, there for her all the time and she when we talked about it, it was the communication, you know, because I didn't want to talk because I see other people going through stuff. For me, it was like, no, they don't need to hear my stuff. I'll just help with them and I'll cope and I'll cope and I'll cope. But then you get to the, the loneliness, as I said before, and depression is very good at that because you don't realize it's happening. You will lock yourself away or you'll not talk as much or you'll distract yourself. And then those problems build and build and build. Um, to the point that, you know, simple things like watching a movie or something, if I was watching it, I might, I'd get really emotional and then think, wow, what's this? You know, it's, you feel it's a weakness. You can't have that emotion because men don't cry, men don't feel this, men don't do that, and men don't talk. And that's wrong. It, I agree with that. But then I'm coming at it as a woman who thinks everyone should talk about it. But how do you take a man that's closed off and doesn't discuss his issues and encourage them, particularly as a woman like me, who's like, well, I'll happily tell you about any emotion. How, how do the people surrounding the men that are struggling, what are they supposed to do? How can they help? Oh, uh, quite a few things that we did is first and foremost is communication that needs to be open all the time, telling someone, how you feel about them tell them that they are wanted they are you know everything all the positives that you need but also not smothering as well let them come to you with the issue um i got to such a broken point that i was sat in the car and i just didn't know which way to turn i recognized it because of my history and also my sort of ambulance service so i kind of knew where i was at and i knew i was in big trouble and i was spiraling rapidly so you know i rang the doctor you know, and spoke to them. And it took a lot for me to do that. But I rang the reception and said, look, I desperately need someone to speak to. Today, my mental health is in a really bad place. And the doctor rang me back and she told me what I needed to do. And those were things I didn't want to do. And that was go and speak to Beg, go and tell her how I'm feeling. And when I did, something it's just alien to me happened. I literally stood there isolated i felt like i was the only person on the planet looking at her and i broke down i cried i just you know and i couldn't stop it it came tumbling out and it was such that i was just i can't and then i couldn't get words out you know um i guess in some way dare i say it it was like a girl cry you know <laughs> or a child cry. <laughs> i don't think you, you could you know? say that <laughs> <Go on. laughs> but no it was like an emotion that just exploded i literally couldn't contain it anymore and that's that's when I knew I'd hit the absolute bottom. Um, you imagine a child crying when they, <gasps> that was where I was at. And why did it take sort of the outside person, the doctor to say that? Cause you said, well, I recognize all the signs and symptoms. Why did you need a doctor to tell you to go and open up to your, to your wife? You, you have a good relationship. Why did it need that? Mm-hmm. 
because I, again, still, I still have that part of me that I didn't want to put that pressure on her. I didn't want to put my worries, my emotions on her um, because she, you know, you just feel like you're the strong one. You have to be, you know, I'm the happy one. I'm the strong one. If ever there's a positive to have somewhere, that's me. You know, we have negatives within our lives. And I will say to her all the time, well, let's think of it this way instead. You know, this is a positive because of this. You know, we've lost business. Okay. Well, we've actually now got more headroom to deal with something. Eh? Or this has happened. So, but then I stopped doing You're that. You're always and, the strong one. Yeah. And I'm the strong one. And most men will feel like that. They have to be the strong one, regardless of what you tell us. <laughs> And when you're, I guess it's your biggest fear. So your sort of breakdown, when you're there sobbing to, to beg, like yeah. that's often for a lot of people, the biggest fear, that absolute breakdown. For anyone that is terrified of opening up and that happening, what happened next? Did it, did the whole world fall apart or, or what happened? So, yeah, it is terrifying because it's that vulnerability. You you become completely and utterly vulnerable. Um, so yeah, I, I could analogise it and put it, you know, a lion with a gazelle. You are that vulnerable that at any given moment you feel that someone could just destroy you and that's not what you want. Um, yeah, did it change? Did, did the world collapse? Um, I didn't feel me at that point. Um, the world, mm -hmm. to me, had collapsed because... You know, even she would say something and I couldn't interpret it the right way it was being said. So I'd then, you know, feel even worse. Does that make sense? You know, so okay. she would say, well, I want you to do this. But I would say, but, you know, and I just couldn't comprehend how she meant it. So it was almost like someone saying, I'm there for you, but grow up. If you were to say that phrase, I would hear the grow up. I wouldn't hear the I'm there for you. So... It, you know, communication was really difficult, but she was there for me. She did support me, and we got we went through it bit by bit. You know, um, and so it wasn't an immediate fix. It wasn't you have a breakdown and it's no. better. It was okay. It's taken okay. months. It's taken months to get back to where I'm at. But I had in my mindset I need to tell people about this because. I've I've seen stuff on social media, some amazing videos. I've said this to you before. You know, my one of my favourites was a veteran in America who gets met by a copper, and he's breaking down. And the copper says to him, "I need to get you help." Ultimately, what happens is the guy says, "I can't afford an ambulance," and the copper turns around and says, "It's on me because I'm asking for it because of where you're at. It's on me." And whilst they're waiting, the he says, "Is there anything I can do for you right now?" And the man that's breaking down says, just a hug. And that was it. And that, again, made me think, wow, that was so amazing. And then six months later, you get another video and they've met up and he's doing so much better. But it was just that human contact he needed. Someone completely alien to him, no judgment whatsoever. And he gave him a hug. And that was just amazing, you know. So, again, it was just, he was at his broken point. So... But then to talk about it, because he felt a failure, but he couldn't afford it. So he saw no way out. But all he needed was that one person to say, there is a way. It's a long road sometimes. And, and it will, you know. And and if somebody was feeling in any way like this, and, you know, hopefully no one is, but the odds are that somebody is, where would you say, where's the best place or a couple of options to go? Where can they turn? So there is so many places you can turn. You may not feel like you can, but definitely go for it. Speak to your family, speak to your loved ones, you know, mum, dad, daughters, children, anybody that's close to you, your wife, your husband. If that doesn't work for you, speak to a doctor, be honest, open up. You know, when you speak to the receptionist, all you have to say is my mental health is so low. I need, I need help today and they will do it. There are charities out there. There is mine, there's Samaritans, there is a million other charities. There are specific ones for men as well. I haven't accessed those, but you have access to them, you know, and they're out there to help you. Um, there are people that want to help and to reduce that death rate, because it's one of the biggest killers of men in the UK. It's heartbreaking. Now, I'm gonna go slightly off this subject. I'm gonna stay on yeah. it a little bit. 
But we are domestic cleaners and obviously you have worked in the cleaning industry a long time. Now I know you specialize more in Airbnbs, but I know as a domestic cleaner, I have gone into a lot of houses where I'm going, oh my gosh, what is this state here? And, and often they are calling cleaners in because it has got to breaking point. And I know that it's got to that breaking point, not because they can't clean or they're too busy. There's often a mental health issue. And sometimes the people will be there with you. As someone that sort of understands this industry and sort of both sides, we, we're often on the front line and they're not turning and getting help, but we are there at the point where they are probably at their, you know, coming to their worst, going help. What would you suggest to cleaners that are being put in that situation? Or in, in I say put, like it's a negative thing, are being given the opportunity to actually make a difference. What can cleaners do? <laughs> Okay, so it depends on your relationship with the client, but if you don't feel you can speak to the client directly, you must have some contact with the family somewhere or friends, neighbours, definitely, you know, speak to someone and ask them, you know, just to check in on them, say to them, you think this is going on. Don't be frightened to say so, because if you're wrong, okay, you're wrong, and that's the way it is. But if you're right, you could have just saved that life. That is the thing to look at. If you're friendlier with a client, you may have a different relationship, then sit down. Do you know what? That bathroom doesn't need cleaning right now. Let's go and have a cup of tea. Let's just have five minutes out of life. And if it means you run over or it means you do something, take that kindness, sit down and go, do you know what? And if you can't do anything, if you just have that cup of tea and realise they need more help, you know, then get into, you know, get them to speak to the doctors and Follow it up. It's not, a, it's not a one day thing. You can't just go, oh yeah, we had a cup of tea and she was all right. Next time you go, how are you feeling today? Take interest. That's what people want, you know? And it's probably this, more the elderly that will deal with that. Yeah, but this can be quite hard, I think, as cleaners, because we don't know the right things to necessarily say. So it's interesting when you say, just say, how are you today? And things like that. But, you know, if you could give some guidance to people that are in that situation, because a lot of us shy away from mental health and go, I don't know what to say. Am I going to make it worth? I don't want to ask them questions that are going to make them feel awkward. Oh, unlike what I'm doing to you here, poor Keith. Um, <laughs> what, what do you say? You know, how would you want to speak to be spoken to? Because you don't want to pry, but equally, you almost have to go, actually, sometimes I am going to overstep the mark a little. Yeah, and to make that person realise, I mean, that the you've got the phrase out of the hashtag and whatever else you want to call it, but it's okay not to be okay. That is a big thing for people to realise. Do you know what? It's all right to not be the person that you think you are, that you want everyone to perceive you as, you know. If you are, if you're down, if you feel like a cry, do you know what? Go and do it. You have to take yourself off into a corner. That's fine, you know, if it bothers you that much. But sit down and just say, look, I want to know about what's going on because I care, you know, because as I said, it's isolation. Depression does that. It makes you isolate yourself. It breaks you down, breaks away your confidence. It breaks away your social skills, your, you know, everything. And all of a sudden you're just sat in this dark corner, um, whether physically or mentally, and you just don't know where to turn. I, th I think I lost that last bit, <laughs> Keith. Um, so I can edit okay. it back in again, but what, I missed that. The internet broke down a little bit. Ah, it's just You were just saying, saying it's about isolation. Yeah, so it isolates you and it is you end up isolating mentally, you isolate um, socially, you, you end up going into a dark corner and ultimately you then become on your own. But for someone to just literally come in and put a hand out and say, it's okay, you can feel like that. But I'm here for you. I care. I want to Keith, know. Keith, I want to reach out to you right now. <laughs> I want to put a hand out and go, Keith, I'll give you a hug. We'll make it better. Let's uh, chat. Let's have a cup of tea. And that, well, that's it. And people, and the worst bit is you will find with families is there's a guilt complex. Because if they don't see it, they are all of a sudden like, you might get a, um, an aggressive response because they're like, who are you to tell me this? you know what, I'm someone who's noticed something and I'm just letting you know because I'm worried and that's it. You know, I've had that throughout life where I've had my episode. People don't see it. They really don't see it because, again, mental health, but male mental, with men, you hide it and you hide it well. 
You know, we're like snipers of the mental health world. We aren't easy to spot a lot of the time. You know, it's difficult. And and how do we go about... Um... How do we go about if there is a man in our lives, whether it's a customer or whether it's a partner or a family member or even a friend, what can we support them with? What can be put in place in their lives or what can we do? Or what can they do to try and prevent this getting to breaking point? What if you had your chance again? And unfortunately, you probably will have your chance again. What can you put in place now to prevent getting to that stage in future? Again, it's things, the conversations, communication is key. Uh, Letting people know that it's okay not to be okay. As a man, you don't have to be strong. You don't have to be the warrior of the, you know, the whole world. The people are there to help you and it's okay to accept help. In fact, you're stronger asking for help. Um, Vulnerability is a good thing because you will see, I mean, for me and Beck, we both have our vulnerabilities and we're extremely open and she has her absolute strengths as I do. But as a couple, both within our own lives and business, we smash it because if I can't deal with something, I mean, she's great with the, uh, the conflict resolution with emails and stuff. She's, she is the word warrior. I would just be like, Oh my God, I just can't cope with this. But again, that can affect my mental health. So she takes that away from me and she deals with it. But vice versa, I deal with the face to face. I'm much better that way. So yeah, just being there for them, talk to them, and yeah, just tell them don't have to be a rock. You can be a bit of a sponge sometimes. You're allowed to be. And if you were feeling low, as you have been, if you had the time again, what would you like to know? What do you wish somebody had said to you or done? What what could anyone do? I think for anyone, I think it's the difficulty is, is if you are hiding it, they can't see it. So for me, it's sometimes I guess you would say just always be there for people regardless. Be kind. That's, you know, kindness is a huge factor. None of us know what the other person is going through in life in general, social media or anywhere. You think someone puts a comment on a social media post that person, it could be enough to tip them. And it may be men in jest or, or, you know, just being quite straight. That's why sometimes I will look at stuff and I'll hold back because I think if I say this, that could explode in this way and I don't want it to. So just being, quite, you know, careful, but not too careful that your kid gloves on everything because you, you can't do that in life. You know, people do need, I guess, some tough love. You need to be told the truth. And I was going to say, Keith, I've seen you be blunt before. I've seen you I say it how it is. <laughs> it's, it's well known and well documented within our business. I can be too blunt and <laughs> I don't see it. So I get told off, but accept it. You know, okay, sorry, I did that wrong. Um, but yeah, accept your faults and your, you know, but just be there for people, really. That's the main thing. Just yeah. So our takeaways from this is have more cups of tea, more love, more asking people how they are and be kind to people no matter what. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You can you can have your conflict. We're all human. It's, it's always going to happen. There's never going to be a day that conflict doesn't happen. But just take that extra thought and think, why is that happening? You know? Someone may just be a little bit distant because they're struggling. They're not quite their hundred percent. They're not that battle ready soldier that you expect them to be. They they may have a wound somewhere that you can't see. I mean, I used to say huge amount of time on the ambulances. Broken bones are easy to fix. They really are because you can see them. Broken minds are far far more difficult to deal with and, and, and mend. So it, and it's true, broken minds are difficult to see and mend. But kindness goes a long way. So let's all be kind a little bit more. Well, can I say, Keith, thank you for really your vulnerability and your openness on this podcast. I hope that and if anyone's listening to this and been affected, I know that you're quite happy to speak to people, aren't you? And reach out. And, yeah. Um, yeah. So you're on Facebook. I think you're on just about everywhere, aren't if you? Anyone's, yeah. If anyone's struggling, my door's open. You know, don't feel like you can't message me. Just send me a message, you know, I will answer it eventually sometimes, but I will get there and I will answer you. So yeah, if you just want to say something to me, bar me, go for it. You know, I'm there. 
as is everyone, I, I would hope, you know. And I mean, so much so with this, and thanks for doing this, Louise, because it's it makes it better. Because I think for us, when we go for our charity of the year, it may be something to do with men's mental health. But also next week, as you mentioned with our podcast, we've also got another man coming on to give his experience. So, you know, it. someone said to me, it really resonated with me. And, yeah. you know, if I've helped one person, that's great. You know, that's better than no people. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think it has to be spoken about more and more and more and from so many different angles, because something's going to resonate with some people and some will resonate with others. Uh, but Keith, mm. thank you for your real mm. honesty and vulnerability. And I really hope it does make a difference. But yeah, if you want to find out more, it's MBT Unplugged. As you said, next week, yep. you are talk doing your second part to talking about men's mental health. And I suspect there's going to be more. Oh, there will be. And then we'll, have, we'll go back to our usual happiness of we have no idea what we're talking about. Here's the subject. We'll, we'll probably go off on a tangent like we always do. But it's all about Airbnb cleaning, isn't it? Holiday let cleaning. It is. Yeah, it is. It's our struggles. It's how we perceive it. It's, you know, and if anyone ever wants to get into it, by all means, give me a shout. You know, that's something else that we're, you know, we're happy to help with. But yeah, good luck with everyone. And yeah, thanks again. Lovely to speak to you. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. Take care. Bye.